Welcome everyone to our second uh, Send Cloud Engineering uh, meetup, the first of 2022. My name is Miguel Borges. I'm one of the product owners here at SendCloud, and I'll be your host tonight. Uh, just a quick intro to those of you who didn't manage to catch us in our first meetup. Uh, but here at SendCloud lately, we've been sharing knowledge internally for a while, and we wanted to start reaching a, a broader audience. And at the same time, we also wanted to learn from others in tech and in the industry. Uh, hence why we try to keep a mix of uh, outside speakers and internal speakers in our meetups. This is not only why we started our meetup series, but also why we started publishing a bit more in our blog on a regular basis. And you can find that blog at dev.2 forward slash sendcloud. Today, we'll be hearing from uh, two, speaker, uh, two speakers uh, on the theme of building for and building the web. Our first speaker is Hida, a front-end accessibility consultant and a former W3C Mozilla developer. Um, in the next web, Hida is going to cover how the web is developed uh, and how it can evolve, uh, particularly in light of the next iteration, Web3. Our second speaker is Rian, a senior front-end developer and architect at SendCloud. In UX and DX in 2022, Rian is going to talk to us a bit more on how we can build the best possible user experience without sacrificing developer experience by walking us through some modern tools and frameworks currently in practice. Um, as usual, please post your questions uh, for both speakers in the chat, and we'll take some time after each speaker for a quick uh, Q&A. Um, today's meetup should take a little over an hour, uh, including the Q&A, so hang tight and enjoy our the, uh, the talks our, talk, our speakers have prepared for you. Hida, the stage is yours. Thanks very much, Miguel. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, Happy New Year, by the way, everyone uh, who is watching. Um, I'm excited to talk to you today about what a next web could look like and also why that's not set in stone. Um, and the reason I want to talk to you um, about this today is that there has been a lot to do about Web3, um, on, uh, on social media and on the web uh, and also in the real world with, with people uh, putting lots of money towards that uh, and investors getting really excited. Um, and I just want to make the point today that there are actually lots of exciting uses for the web and, and problems outside the realm of, of Web3 uh, that also are worthy of our, um, our attention. So, um, with that uh, out of the way, my name is Hida. Uh, as Miguel mentioned, uh, I am a front-end developer and accessibility specialist. Um, and um, you can follow me on Twitter at HTV, or I have a blog as well. That's Hida.blog. Uh, you can subscribe to that and, and stuff like that if you want to. Uh, but I'm here to talk, to talk to you about the web. And I want to take you first back to the World Wide Web, which was kind of the first iteration uh, of the web. Um, when it was kind of first uh, uh, invented. And that takes us all the way back to March 1983. Tim Berners-Lee worked at CERN, which is that institute where they do um, uh, physics research. Uh, they have the Large Hadron Collider in, in Geneva. Uh, and he was working there. Um, and at some point, he had some idle time and, and spent it to make a proposal to make it easier to manage documents. He figured out that there was often the need to find some document uh, and it would be residing on some computer somewhere in the building. Um, and he had to like go to the physical machine, find the information. And he wondered whether it would be a better thing if he could actually access that information through some kind of web. Um, so it was available on different computers and he wanted to make a way to uh, access it remotely somehow. So he wrote this proposal uh, that he called information management, uh, somewhat boring title. Uh, and he submitted that to his manager, Mike Sandel, who wrote famously these three words on there, vague but exciting. Uh, so he was moderately excited, I will say. Um, and I think that just ended up in a drawer somewhere um, until a couple of months later and circulated again. Uh, and some people in within CERN got excited about this proposal uh, and started to do more work on it and kind of gather people, gather budget and um, work on it a bit more. Now in 1990, that resulted in formulating three basic ideas that still underpin the web, HTML, 
URI and HTTP. So HTML is the markup language that we use to mark up content. It's basically what makes that the web isn't a plain text kind of thing, uh, but that we actually have richer web pages with things like headings and lists and images, links, uh, important things that you know we need a language for. Um, the URI, uh, a way to access content with an address, um, it's a uniform resource identifier, uh, as Tim Berners-Lee calls it, and at the W3C, it's still uh, called that. Many others will just call it URL, a uh, resource locator. It's a similar thing. Um, and then there's HTTP, which is what describes how kind of documents are uh, transferred and, and how all of that works. So HTML, URI, and HTTP were invented at the time, and they still underpin the current web. Now, what's kind of revolutionary about all this is that the history could have gone two ways. Uh, it could have become a commercial enterprise uh, of Berners-Lee Limited, uh, where we all had to kind of pay fees and, and uh, ask permission to make it onto the web. But um, you know, they decided and convinced the CERN management to actually make the code available and um, do that royalty-free. So Tim Berners-Lee said, um, uh, on the FAQ that you can find on his webpage, had the technology been proprietary and in my total control, it would probably not have taken off. You can't propose that something is universal space and at the same time keep control of it. So he realized that early on and made it available uh, and convinced the management of CERN to make it available openly without royalties so that we can now all enjoy uh, web technology. Uh, a year later, he moved to MIT in Boston, uh, from Geneva to Boston, uh, where the Worldwide uh, Web Consortium was founded, the W3C. Uh, and it still has a similar uh, slogan, the W3C wants to realize the full potential of the web. Uh, and having worked there, I know from our team meetings that that involves a lot of different things. It's not just um, HTML and CSS and what happens there. Uh, but it's standards in all sorts of different areas that um, where web technology gets used and where it may need to be used in the in the future. Uh, lots of stuff gets explored there. Um, and what's an important aspect, I think, is that a lot of web technologies are formulated in so-called web standards. Um, and web standards are really uh, important because they ensure that all these different systems that work with the web work in the same way. At least they tried to ensure that this wasn't the case when the web first came out and it wasn't the case 10 years later either uh, because there were lots of different web browsers that displayed content in slightly different ways and sometimes they had features that were different. That's still somewhat the case, but the, the web of today is, is a lot more interoperable uh, than it had been at the start. So web standards make sure that web browsers, but also authoring tools that create web content, uh, devices that use the web, like fridges and cars and you know whatever you can imagine that uses the web, websites themselves, and they all kind of have a common understanding of what web technology uh, looks like, what expectations are, uh, and that they're all on the same page. And that's extremely helpful. And it makes that you know we can use the web on so many different devices um, and that it is somewhat easy to build for the web somewhat. Uh, so yeah, this was important because sometimes uh, websites just would only work in one browser and that that is not great. And still it happens sometimes when a browser will ship a technology that isn't in other browsers, uh, but it's kind of a minimum at a minimum now where uh, you know that was a lot worse before. Now web standards are also great because um, they ensure, uh, at least in the, the way that they work at the W3C and other organizations, that the web is made with diverse inputs and that a lot of different people can contribute uh, to the web, lots of different stakeholders. Uh, if you're excited about that, uh, Rachel Andrew has a great blog post uh, about how the W3C works and how you can uh, contribute to it too. So that's the web when it was invented. And there was a point where people started talking about Web 2.0. Web 2.0 was something that people suddenly started talking about. When I started working on the web, uh, this was kind of already going on and started to become a bigger thing. Um, and Web 2.0 was coined in 1999 by a UX consultant. Uh, she wrote about it first uh, in uh, something called Print Magazine, uh, ironically. Um, and she wrote about 
kind of how Web 2.0, this new thing would compare to the old thing, Web 1.0. So you explain it as, you know, we have Pong and we are going to have the matrix. It is going to be hugely different. Uh, and now that the infrastructure was in place, this new web is going to change everything because we will be using this existing infrastructure in very exciting new ways. So C talked about how the old web was mostly like static pages and how the new web could be more seen like a transport mechanism uh, through which interactivity happened. So a lot more interactive web pages that interact with each other in a really exciting way. Um, so that's, I think, a really cool uh, thing to actually look back to this article. I've linked it uh, on the slides web page that I'll be sharing later. So then you can read it too. It's a PDF file. Um, ironically, it's not on the web. Uh, but this article describes the future of the web in a very early time in 1999. Uh, it talks about how the web would eventually appear on your TV, on your car dashboard, on your cell phone, handheld machines, whatever they are, uh, and also your microwave. And I think we can now say in 2022 that actually all of these places can actually have web technology built into them. I don't personally have a microwave that's connected to the web, but I think that exists. Uh, at least I know fridges with uh, with web technology exist. Uh, so you know, it's about using that existing web technology in, in different ways. The same technology like HTTP used in more places in more exciting ways. Uh, and I think that that description that she did in that article is quite nice. Uh, and it really describes like, this is how we can make the web better and use it in more interesting ways. Years later, Web 2.0 got further popularized by a publisher who kept calling it web as a platform. And platforms came about lots of different platforms where people were supposed to contribute their own content. So where websites were static before, people would write documents and put them online. This was all about websites where you could create content together with other people, like comment on each other's stuff, uh, upload your own photos and videos, uh, short texts. Uh, you can share bookmarks um, on websites like YouTube and Flickr and Twitter. Uh, some of these are still around. Delicious was a really cool place where you could like share links uh, that you found on the web. Kind of one of the most important things on the web is links. So that was that was really cool. Um, all of these things could kind of be described by different buzzwords. There wasn't one clear definition of Web 2.0. Um, preparing this talk, I saw an interview with Tim O'Reilly, uh, that publisher I mentioned earlier, who said, oh, I don't really do definitions. But what he did do is like describe a lot of different uh, bits of technology that would underpin uh, Web 2.0. And that's how I'm going to describe Web 2.0 to you. Uh, there's a lot of different things that um, are properties of uh, this Web 2.0. So one is user-generated content, as I mentioned before. So people writing content on these platforms. Uh, so these are websites that didn't have any content themselves but relied on users to provide that content. Um, it also included like review websites and, and stuff like that. Another big phenomenon in Web 2.0 was software as a service. We still do that quite a lot. So platforms that would offer software as a service, folksonomy where users would be tasked with creating taxonomies. So tagging different photos and different videos saying like, here's a video that is about cats, not about dogs. Uh, and then relying on users to make sure that all the cat videos were properly categorized. That was a big thing in Web 2.0. Um, open APIs were a big thing. So you would be able to include your last five tweets on your own homepage. That's a lot harder these days because the open APIs of the time are now all run by platforms that have become more like walled gardens. Uh, but still, open APIs were a thing. They're still a thing in some platforms. And then there were lots of like widgets where you could include parts of websites on your own websites and kind of mesh up different parts of websites. Now, um, Tim Berners-Lee talked about this in an interview and said, you know, Web 2.0 is, of course, a piece of jargon. Nobody ever understands what it means. Uh, or nobody even understands what it means. So. That's what he said about it. Um, I think if you look at all the different characteristics uh, and, and kind of look back at what the web was at the time, 
a picture emerges and you know there are kind of commonalities between websites that emerged at the time and a lot of the web 2.0 stuff is still around but in a slightly different shape like the gardens have become a bit more walled uh, compared to what they were at the time and that brings me to the next stage or at least what some people want to propose is the next stage and i'm putting it in air quotes because I don't think groups of people should be naming new versions of the web. Like there are no version numbers, at least you know, W3C or other organizations, they don't release new versions of the web. Uh, this is entirely because a community believes this exists. Um, so Web3 was something coined in 2014 by the inventor of a blockchain technology. Uh, web 3.0, with a space between 3.0 and web, already existed before, um, Tim and Ashley talked about it in 2006 uh, and named it the semantic web. That didn't take off as much as he hoped. Um, so it was coined at the time, uh, it is coined again, but without the 0.0 and without the space weirdly between uh, web and, and three. So what's 3.0, uh, what's web three? It is again, just like web two, more like a marketing term, an umbrella term for a bunch of different technologies, uh, which some people refer to as the future of the web. It's an umbrella term for different properties that people like, a vision of the web that largely runs on the blockchain in, uh, in order to make owning assets better for people, better in air quotes, owning in air quotes as well, uh, who create them. So the assets are created by people and it's somehow uh, supposed to make it easier for other people to own these digital assets uh, by cutting out middlemen. So the buzzwords are decentralized, transparent, blockchain, immutable, creators, and scarcity. And I think this is really impressive when people talk about it. And when they first did it, I didn't understand what they were talking about. I was quite impressed hearing about this stuff, but I think it's important to ask questions about you know, what all of this is and if it really makes a lot of sense. In the next few slides, I will be drawing on what the work other people did and the articles other people wrote. Uh, and I'll be sharing the links later on so you can read them at your own leisure. But you could ask things like, is it really decentralized as Molly White did in a brilliant recent article? A lot of the Web3 APIs and wallets and exchanges are actually central entities. And if they're not even, then they're still often run on central services like Google or AWS. You could also ask if they're really transparent. Um, the blockchain might be transparent, like everyone can go to the blockchain and figure out how transactions happen and when and how and what they are. But it requires a deep technical knowledge that I don't think regular users of the web actually have. And there are things on the web that are transparent that aren't so clear to these people either, like um, websites that have a little lock in front of them because they are served via HTTPS Many people don't understand how to verify who has signed these uh, these signatures and how to figure out if a website is really the website you are looking for. Like a bank's website, uh, let's say ing.nl or um, ing.iamahacker.something else.something else.something else might really look like that web page. It is not. Um, and it's really hard for regular users of the web to actually figure out. Uh, about this. So the transparency properties of the uh, current web are hard to use. And I think that's still the case for blockchain-based technologies. It might be even a, bit, a little harder because there's a lot of technological stuff there that requires deep knowledge that people might not have. So the transparency might not be of as much value to those people. You could also ask if it's really immutable. Uh, exchanges are um, able to freeze assets which they've sometimes proven to do, or they can do a hard reset when they are hacked. This has also happened. Uh, and the freezing has happened when someone's apes were stolen and stuff like that. Uh, Molly White describes this in her uh, recent article. And uh, you could also ask if it's immutable in the sense that someone could make an NFT that is changing based on who views it. So an NFT uh, points to a picture, um, and what the picture is, is actually not something that is fixed. What the picture is, is, um, you know, it lives on a URL and uh, anyone who knows anything about the web knows that what's on a URL is controlled by the person running the server that serves that URL, right? Uh, and it can listen to headers and serve different things based on what the headers say. 
which is what Moxie Marlin Spike, the founder of the Signal app, has done. He's made an NFT that looks different uh, based on whether it served an open sea or rareable or looked at in a wallet. Uh, it actually served as a pile of poo there. Um, is it really going to protect creators? Another question you could ask. Um, and I think it's not got a great tech uh, um, track record uh, when it comes to protecting creators. Anyone can create NFTs, even of stuff that's not theirs. There's no like checks for do you own the copyright? Are you the person who you say you are? Uh, and artists are actually seeing their work showing up in NFTs that they didn't mint themselves. Um, that's something that The Verge wrote recently. Uh, and there's a lot of examples in the article that I'm sharing here. You could also wonder whether it's really going to protect creators in the sense that royalties are not actually defined in the standard, uh, quote unquote, uh, that describes how non-fungible tokens are uh, on the, how they fit on the Ethereum blockchain. So um, royalties are not defined there. One of the things that are claimed to be the most important parts of uh, um, what this whole thing is about. And then something else you could wonder when it's about protecting creators and making it great for artists is, does paying artists more money actually require this technology? Can't we just transfer the money? And I know in the US, transferring small amounts of money is hard, but I know it across Europe that I can transfer amounts as small as one euro cent uh, to anywhere in Europe within seconds, uh, because that is something that actually exists in, in Europe. So, um, and it's not a new thing either. I remember 15 years ago um, that I could transfer uh, money with internet banking that way without fees. Um, is there really scarcity? Another question to ask, I think, when you buy an NFT, the only thing that's really scarce is the unique hash. Look it up if you don't uh, believe me. Um, Another thing to look at is who's hyping this. And what I'm finding is that a lot of people hyping it or everyone hyping it, uh, as far as I've been able to find out, is actually people who have an interest in this because they've invested in it or because it will personally enrich them if more people get into crypto or more people get into Web3. It's fine, things that enrich people. Uh, I enrich myself too. I have a business um, and I charge money for the services that I do. Uh, I have not much against capitalism so much. Just I don't like it as an argument for Web3 because people say that Web3 is going to make things better and it isn't if uh, this is all about um, your own uh, wallet. Now, there are a lot of reasons mentioned in this article called The Third Web that, um, uh, that I recommend you to look up that go into all sorts of different reasons why people look into uh, Web3 technologies. Um, but none of them are actually things that are better for society. They're all things that make sense for person, personally uh, for, for people. Um, another article that I found interesting uh, called the Web3 Fraud also underlies that um, Web3 only exists to hide the underlying cryptocurrencies. So the actual utility that these systems have is already available in other systems that don't rely on the blockchain. Now, as a philosopher, and I'm a philosopher turned technologist, uh, I want to see arguments. I want to see proper arguments that don't rely on just, you know, this is good for myself. Um, so I want to see how this is actually helping people, uh, because I don't think we have to make everything about money. Some of us just want to use the web to access information securely, accessibly, and with minimal privacy impact. I think that's important, and I think we've got to make sure that Web3 uh, doesn't just create problems and it also solves actual problems that we can all agree are real problems and aren't solved better by current technology. So basically Web3 uh, needs skeptics and I can recommend you to look at the website called web3isgoinggreat.com and it also links out to a list of Twitter, uh, a Twitter list that you can follow and find some other skeptics there. So what is an exciting future for the web? I think there are a bunch of different things that are exciting about the web uh, and things that I like to see going forward and that I am excited about. And I uh, invite you all to be excited about these other things that are also futures of the web that don't rely on blockchain and that are actually solving real problems. Like I wanna see a web with better styles and 2022 is gonna bring a lot of updates to CSS 
It is the year of CSS and it's going to bring lots of exciting things as you can find in this article from Pramis van Tamme. Um, I want to see a web and easier web payments and the web payments API or the web payment request API, I should say, is a really exciting step in that direction. Uh, I want to see a web that has easy and safe authentication. And there are lots of cool companies that work in that space. There's also a government ID system that we have in the Netherlands called DigiD uh, that actually works really well because you can log in with this through lots of different or almost all of the Dutch government uh, uh, layers, including uh, your own city, including the central government, uh, including uh, the tax office. So all of these can be logged in with, with this one system that actually works really well and has lots of good accessibility features too. I want to see a web with more art too. Uh, there's a bunch of Dutch museums that have put on their entire collection on the web and you can look at it in high resolution. And some of these like Rijks Museum actually invite you to create prints and derivative works from these uh, uh, high resolution images. So that's a cool way to use the web, I think, that actually solves a real problem. We all need more art in our lives. And this is real art, not monkeys and apes. Um, then I like to see a web with more personal sites. I invite you to look at personalsite.es, uh, which has a list of lots of cool websites that people created themselves where they actually own their own content without putting it on the blockchain. So basically my gist here today is that the next web isn't set in stone. There are lots of interesting challenges and lots of interesting plans that go way beyond those that are posed by the Web3 crowd. Um, so yeah, there are lots of unsolved problems like the web, lack of web accessibility or Facebook's business model. Um, and there are also lots of cool plans that solve these problems, uh, including legislation, including new web standards that are much better than what the Web3 crowd is proposing and kind of trying to force upon us. So wrapping up, I want to say that the, we've come a very long way since the invention of the web. Lots of cool things are happening on the web, lots of exciting developments. I want to tell you that Web3 isn't what it seems and invite you to do a bit of research into that. Uh, I'm sharing the article, so uh, have a look at those. Um, and lastly, I want to say that there isn't one set of plans and challenges for the future of the web. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can improve the web. Uh, and I invite you to look at all of these and um, you know, think about what you think are the biggest problems in society uh, and figure out how we can use the web to, to solve them. Because the web is an amazing place um, and you know, it can solve a lot of problems for us. So let's be critical of what the problems are we're trying to solve and also how we solve those problems. Thanks very much for listening. Um, I have my slides up on talks.hiddenfreeze.nl, which I'll be tweeting out later at HDV uh, as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Hida. That was super interesting. Uh, quite a good look into the some of the issues uh, we have right now. And we have some a few questions from uh, from the audience. <clears throat> One of them you mentioned about, like as you were talking now about uh, uh, contributing as well, and you also mentioning web standards uh, and a blog post about it. Uh, could you share some more information about it? How you, we we could be get involved more with it, and maybe share the link in the in the chat as well. Yeah, yeah, totally. So the, the link is available with my uh, with my slides. I'll be putting it in this chat later as well. Uh, it's a blog post by Rachel Andrew, who is a developer who has worked with Web Standards for a very long time. Uh, and in that, she explains kind of how you can get involved. So Web Standards are created by members, uh, organizations of the W3C and other uh, standards organizations. Uh, so if you want to contribute to Web Standards, the easiest way is to be an employee of those organizations. Uh, but they are also regularly looking for input from regular web developers and sometimes also invite them to contribute to these standards. There's lots of ways that you can uh, contribute. And Rachel goes into many of those uh, in that blog post. Fantastic. Look forward to, to seeing those. Uh... Yeah, if uh, there was another question, like if there was proper versioning of uh, of the web, as you mentioned, there isn't really. Uh, and looking more towards the future, not only the points that you mentioned that should actually be in Web three, what you think should would uh, would be something that could show up in Web four, for example. Yeah, so for me, it's about things like how can we make it easier for people to make stuff on the web. Like I mentioned, personal websites. 
uh, I think it should be easier than it is today to have your own website. Like it's somewhat easier for people who are into web development, uh, but I want um, all the neighbors in my street who have a wild variety of different jobs that they do. Many are outside tech, I guess all of them are. I want them to be able to write on their own blogs and, and make that much easier um, through centralized platforms and also maybe decentralized ones. Um, I think that's exciting. I think new developments in authentication, web payments, uh, all of these are, are going to solve problems that are uh, real uh, and important uh, for, uh, for us. I like to focus on uh, problem solving for sure. <laughs> Uh, one of the comments from uh, Philip on uh, on YouTube, uh, he was asking a bit more about CSS container queries. When you were talking about uh, CSS uh, developments, this uh, coming coming up. Yeah, what was the question? About he was just he was just uh, making a, a comment regarding CSS qu uh, container queries. Looking to the to the side, jokingly, yes. Cool, cool. Yeah, they are really exciting, I think. And for a long time, we've been told it's hard to do container queries and kind of computably impossible. Like you can't compute so fast um, and there could be circular things and, um, and stuff like that. Um, but they are uh, here now. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's really cool. Um, they are coming to browsers likely in, uh, in this year, um, but not so browser vendors on board. Fantastic. Then last but not least, uh, another question that we received, when will uh, RSS and the superior Google reader, arguably, make the comeback it deserves? Yeah, I love that question. I, I use feedbin.com, uh, which is a service that makes it quite easy to, uh, to read RSS. Um, and I always encourage people to have RSS on their blogs. I know like Twitter removed it from tweets. Uh, but I think it's a great way to read content without kind of being bothered by, you know, all that stuff that the modern web has to offer, like uh, pop-ups and uh, annoying ads and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, I love our ads and I hope Google will uh, come back with a new Google Reader because that was a really good piece of software. Yeah, rest in peace. <laughs> Let's see what uh, the future holds. Um, that was all from uh, the questions from the audience. Thank you, uh, Hedia. Thank you very much. And yeah, looking for uh, looking forward to for the links that you shared as well, and uh, to follow you on uh, on on Twitter and to hear more from uh, from you on what Web three has to has to offer. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Miguel, for having me. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Definitely our pleasure. Coming up now, we have uh, Rian and her talk about a uh, user experience and developer experience in twenty twenty two. Please take the floor, Hida. Thanks, Miguel. And uh, thanks, Huda, for such a nice talk um, about Web3 and where the web is going. Um, I'm also going to talk about a little bit about where the web is going, or at least where web development is going. From a front-end perspective, I'd like to talk about the intersection between user experience, something that's close to my heart as a front-end developer, uh, and developer experience. Um, the problem I want to look at is uh, the single-page application, um, or SPA, you can call it. Uh, it's become an industry standard. But I want to ask the question, has the industry maybe moved too fast or a little in the wrong direction? Um, yeah, it's true that many developers, and myself included, find working on a single page application to be a smooth and logical way of working. It's a good, user, uh, good developer experience. Um, but there is a cost maybe to the user experience. And should every site be a single page application? So I'm going to try and answer some of these questions in this talk. I'm going to start by looking at the relationship between user experience and developer experience examining how this relationship is impacted by common tools and techniques that we use in front-end development these days. And then we're going to have a little look at some of the newer tools that are trying to improve the situation and the status of those, and maybe even suggest when you might want to use them. So uh, let's start by looking at the user experience part of the equation. And there are so many factors that contribute to a good user experience. So let's focus on those that can actually be affected by our development tools. Um, and I'm thinking specifically here of performance. Google's got a set of metrics that we can use to look at performance. They're called Web Vitals or Core Web Vitals. Um, and this is a, a project that, um, in their own words, aims to provide unified guidance for quality signals that are essential to delivering a great user experience on the web. The two metrics I think we should look at are largest contentful paint 
which measures the loading performance of a web page and faster is better, as you might imagine. And then first input delay, and that measures how quickly your page becomes interactive, how quickly the user can start actually interacting, clicking on things and getting a response. And again, faster is better here. So with Largest Contentful Paint, if your page loads a large JavaScript bundle, uh, the browser needs to download that bundle, needs to pass the bundle, and needs to execute the bundle, possibly multiple bundles, as you can see in the screenshot. Uh, if you've built a single page application, um, it's actually quite common that you need the bundle or bundles to be downloaded, passed, and executed before anything even appears on the page. And maybe you get a loading spinner. But um, in this example here, you can see there's nothing for two seconds. Uh, and depending on the size of the bundle, then uh, that can have a really large impact on the largest contentful paint me metric. If we look at the first input delay metric and how um, front-end development impacts that, yeah, and unfortunately, JavaScript again plays a role. If your JavaScript takes a really long time to execute, uh, you can end up actually locking up the main thread of the browser while waiting for it all to complete. And if the main thread of the browser is completely engaged with executing your JavaScript, then user interactions won't do anything. So users can click around, but nothing's going to happen. Uh, nothing is more frustrating than when that happens. So obviously, this is a bad user experience. Uh, and in this screenshot, this is from the Chrome DevTools. Um, you can see at the top, the yellow peaks are when JavaScript is sort of maxing out the CPU, maxing out the thread of the browser. Uh, at the bottom, every single red flagged yellow block is a JavaScript task that uh, the Chrome DevTools has marked as long. Basically, it's taking too long. Um, yeah, and this is on a site that I uh, commonly find, even on a fast machine, has the user experience issues. OK, so we know what the metrics are. Putting those aside for a moment, um, what's a good front-end developer experience? The expectation these days is largely that we are able to build a UI that's highly interactive, that data is loaded without having to navigate away from the current page, and that any navigation that you do should be extremely fast. So essentially, we're building experiences that are closer to mobile applications than traditional websites. And then to be as efficient as we can as developers, we also want to co-locate related code, so styles, templating, and logic. Um, and we also want that code to be reusable. So in other words, we kind of want component-driven development. We encapsulate styles, templating, and logic, or CSS, HTML, and JavaScript into components, which are reusable building blocks that can be used in other places in the application. And then because we're making the UI highly interactive, it's really helpful to have state management. So that leads to the JavaScript framework, React, Vue.js, Angular, there's so many more. And these tools allow us to build app-like experiences or single page applications with ease. That's what they're intended for. Code is shareable and it's easy to understand because it's all co-located in these components. But how do these frameworks affect the user experience? So I don't want to be too harsh because there are many positives. Um, as developers, we can work faster and more effectively with small, easy to understand components supported by these frameworks, which often have a really strong community, great documentation, and which are well maintained. So yeah, this likely leads to increased speed of development. So you can fix production issues quicker and you can deliver new features faster. That's good for the user. And then an app-like experience also, honestly, it sounds great. Nice, quick navigations, they feel almost instant, a highly interactive UI that doesn't need to wait for a full page reload. Um, they, they are great, these things, but I think we need to remember that there is also a cost. So typically, uh, as I said, component-based development and the frameworks that support that encourage that we build a single page application. Uh, this is fully client rendered rather than server rendered. So, in practice, that means the browser downloads a really small amount of HTML. Maybe there's a loading spinner on it, probably little else. The average amount of CSS, that sort of depends on how you built it. And then a lot of JavaScript. And we can see the effect of the single page application and also just the rise of JavaScript um, across uh, page weight, the page rate metric over time, looking at how large websites are. So yeah, since this is starting at 2012, this graph, we can see that median page weight is climbing. Um, and there are some equivalent graphs. This is from the HTTP archive, um, Web Almanac, and the size of JavaScript is doing the same. Every year, it just gets a bit bigger, uh, except for that dip sometime in uh, 2018, I think. Um, but coming back to our metrics, large contentful paint and first input delay, 
um, both of which are affected negatively by large JavaScript files. So you can start to see how this might be a problem. There is this impact of the tools we use, the frameworks, the kind of development that we're doing that can, if we're not careful, cause larger JavaScript files which impact performance metrics and user experience. Now, there are, of course, ways around this. Um, modern frameworks really encourage you to do code splitting, so you don't send the user all of the JavaScript for the entire application, maybe just the initial view, and other views or pages are loaded in later, other parts of the application are loaded in later. Um, we can also ask the browser to cache these files aggressively, so they won't need to be downloaded again the next time the user views the page. Um, I will note they do still need to be passed and executed though, and that actually does take quite a long time on some devices if they're older or slower. So yeah, these are all good, good coping mechanisms, good mitigation of the issue, but is it just extra effort to fix a problem that we could have prevented? Because ultimately a page without JavaScript is faster than a page with it. Uh, I do want to touch on the topic of server-side rendering, which is quite popular these days and is supported by many JavaScript frameworks. So they are trying to, to help with the issue. Server-side rendering or SSR means that um, although you build your application more or less in the same way as you would for a single page application, you render the entire page on the server initially rather than rendering it on the client using JavaScript. And then you use a technique called hydration to add back the interactivity using JavaScript. So this leads to a really fast initial render because it's just HTML that isn't blocked by JavaScript hogging the main thread. But the downside is that you are sending the user everything twice, essentially. They need to download the server rendered page. And then in most frameworks, you also then need to download a massive punch of JavaScript. Then the entire page is taken over by the client side framework and made interactive through hydration, essentially reactivating it into a single page application. Um, and much of that page might not even need to be interactive. It really depends because maybe there's just a few buttons on a page full of text, especially if this is a content heavy site. So, uh, you know, maybe we don't need to have the full single page application takeover. Uh, some tools are trying to make this a little bit smarter, um, especially on slower devices. Um, but yeah, downloading things twice isn't a great user experience. So I think it's good to challenge the assumption that everything should be a single page application. Um, the benefits, as we've looked at, app-like experience, fast navigation, et cetera. Now that is fine and that is great if you assume your user is going to have your site open in a, in a browser tab all day and they're gonna have really deep engagement with it. Um, that maybe executing lots of tasks, they don't want to wait for the page to reload when they send it to form, maybe they're power users of a particular web application. Um, but many pages on the web are really only for shallow engagement. Um, do users really engage deeply with a, a marketing site, a blog? Uh, maybe they do with Hitter's blog, but because it's great, but a news site, for instance, yeah, you're not going to spend a lot of time there. Um, you maybe view one or two pages on the site before you go elsewhere. So. Do you need the navigation? Do you really need it to be lightning fast and have this app-like experience at the expense of other things? So when we build something, let's ask ourselves, do we genuinely expect deep engagement? Of course, we all want it, um, but is it realistic? And then the other question is, who are we building it for? Um, who is our user? Are they on mobile more than desktop? Because if so, we should expect to see older, less powerful devices, uh, a less reliable connection speed, so we kind of want them to download, pass, and execute less JavaScript, not more. Uh, this is a great moment to look at analytics data if you have it. Make sure you're considering the device details, the device type. And if it's important to you that your user actually views your page, which it should be, then do remember that loading speeds are directly tied to conversion rates. If your tight site is too slow, then it actually might be losing you money to have performance issues. Okay, so now I've told you single page applications are not the answer to everything. Um, then what is the solution when we want to build a really fast site, but we still want to use components because that's a nice developer experience. So uh, let's start with a tool called Astro. Um, in their own words from their site, they say Astro is a new kind of static site builder for the modern web. Powerful developer experience meets lightweight output. Sounds pretty good. With Astro, the power of it is that you can write components in almost any framework that you choose. So they support React, Vue, Solid, Svelte, off the top of my head, and several more. And they also provide an abstraction layer over HTML. Uh, that's their own .astro files. And then by default, everything compiles to plain HTML uh, with no interactivity. So the JavaScript is actually stripped out. 
So, and then as the developer, you have to specify exactly which components that should be interactive. You can have them become interactive at runtime, um, maybe when the browser viewport is a certain size or when they're scrolled into view. And Astro's power is that it does remove your JavaScript by default. So it makes you, the developer, think about when does JavaScript really need to be there? And um, for many content heavy sites, especially, you might just need your navigation to be interactive or a button loading a modal or a buy it now button. Um, that's only where you need the interactivity. The rest can be static. So a full single page application would be overkill. And Astro lets us build in a modern component based way but then we get the interactivity when we need it. Um, and how does it do that? Well, it actually does use the hydration concept we mentioned earlier with server-side rendering, but in this case, it's partial hydration. So rather than the entire page being hydrated, only the single component that needs to be made interactive gets the JavaScript downloaded. So you get download maybe a few kilobytes of JavaScript rather than hundreds of kilobytes potentially. And that's a much better situation. And Astro also uses a concept called island architecture so components that need to be interactive render in isolation and then they load individually and you start with fast server rendered html and then individual components are added on top of that so rather than the old single page application way of having to wait for the whole javascript bundle to be you know, downloaded passed and executed before anything shows on screen um, you've already got something immediately on screen for the user now astro is um, exciting because it's being very actively developed. They have a great Discord community. And in the past couple of days, it's actually received $7 million in seed funding and they're forming a company around it. So definitely something to keep an eye on. I would say even to start consider using in small production sites. Um, and what I also really like about it is that it encourages adoption because it's uh, attracting developers who are already using you know, popular frameworks like React and Vue to write their components. Well, the experience is not so different for them and they can already get started using components they already have. Um, there's another new tool, Quick, uh, from the company Builder.io, and this aims to solve the performance problem in a pretty similar way, actually. Uh, it's fo they focus on the fastest possible time for the page to be interactive. That's what they're aiming for with this. Uh, and again, we start with server-rendered HTML because most of the page doesn't need to be interactive. And then, as with Astro, it hydrates the components that need it. Um, Quick's power is that it can hydrate these components uh, out of order, asynchronously, there's really fine grained control given to the developer over this partial hydration. The difference um, with Astro is that it uses a quick specific component syntax. So that's something to learn. You can't just, I think at time of writing or presenting, you can't just plug in a view component. Yeah, if it gets adoption, maybe we overcome that hurdle. But for now, you have to use their component syntax. Um, also, the documentation is a bit sparse, so I mention it as something to watch, but I think it's a project in its early stages. And then uh, this might surprise you, but um, partial hydration, this surprised me, partial hydration has been around for longer than you might think. Um, there's a tool called Marco by eBay, which had, I think, this concept of partial hydration maybe even as early as 2014. Um, it's been used in production for quite a few years. Uh, it's built by eBay, so clearly it's got a lot of users uh, looking at it. Um, and it's actively being developed, modernized, and improved. Um, but again, it does require that you use their specific component syntax. So you can build using their components, um, but not with the frameworks that you might be used, used to. OK, so we've looked at some options. There are others. Um, off the top of my head, there's SvelteKit is looking at applications. Um, Rich Harris did a very nice talk on transitional apps, which is this a uh, different kind of application from a single page application. Um, there's things like um, Eleventy is a pure static site generator, but I think there is a tool on top of that called Slinkity, which is looking at maybe uh, allowing you to use components with it. So there's a few people exploring this space. But what should you actually use? Is it still okay to build a single page application in 2022? Well, of course, the answer is a typical developer answer. It depends. Um, I do think that if we care about the user experience, we do need to start with the user. And the chances are you probably already know quite a lot about how your user behaves. So and a personal example I can give at SendCloud is that we know from talking to our users who are merchants who sell and ship products, they often do keep the SendCloud application open on one or maybe multiple computers 
almost always desktop in their warehouses or back offices, and they need to process orders and create labels quickly. And so they need a highly reactive, fast user interface, um, which is lots of form elements and data display. Um, so they have this efficient workflow. So for, this is deep engagement. That's a good example of deep engagement with an application. And it makes a single application, single page application, an appropriate choice in this situation. Of course, we still want to have great performance and want to improve it and make it faster, but um, that's a good starting point. So um, also do note, I mentioned specifically that people on desktop uh, are on desktop when they're um, our SendCloud merchants. The desktop versus mobile question is actually quite important because um, if you think about uh, leaving a page open, you can do that on desktop and nothing, nothing happens, you can come back to it later. But mobile browsers actually often do not let users leave pages open for a long time. They intervene um, and they'll force the reload if you try and return to a page that you had open in your browser. So you can't necessarily count on the page being left open on mobile. So if your users are all on mobile, yeah, maybe maybe don't build a single page application if you want that deep engagement and you're expecting that deep engagement. I mean, maybe do, you know, live your best life and do what you think is right for your user, but um, it's something to consider. And yeah, on the other hand, for a content heavy site, a marketing site, a blog, a news site, um, it's interesting that engagement is more focused around specific articles. Uh, users often get to those through social media, newsletters uh, or they're looking for something particular so of course again we want them to stay on site but realistically users are more likely to dip in for what they want and then leave again uh, maybe come back later but it's not that consistent usage engagement is more shallow in these cases so i would say this is a good case to look carefully at what needs to be interactive so maybe astro marco or maybe even quick although it's quite early stages maybe some of those tools might work here so yeah, to conclude, um, in 2022, I am really excited because I think we're, we're already starting to see people exploring this space. It's a changing landscape for web tooling. And I think there's a much wider awareness of how performance is a really vital part of the user experience. Um, I would always suggest that you prioritize your users before your developers, uh, but looking at the future, maybe we can have our cake and eat it too. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. And yeah, I'm on Twitter. Uh, and LinkedIn if you have questions after the session. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Rian. That was a, quite, a cool quite a cool talk, quite a, a lot of uh, a few resources that are worth exploring. Um, we have a, a few questions uh, again. One of them you mentioned, you were mentioning that through some user research and uh, contacting users that we know that they spend a lot of time on our website, uh, right, at SendCloud. But besides that, how are we, uh, could you give us more examples of how are we measuring against these metrics? So also the performance of the of the panel as well in itself? Yeah, we have a few products. Uh, we have the platform. We also have a more user facing. So uh, as opposed to just our merchants, the users of our merchants, we have some products that face those. So they're very public, um, like tracking pages and return portals. Um, yeah, we have, uh, we actually use a tool called SpeedCurve to monitor performance, um, keep an eye on it. We have, we try to keep, the, the bundle sizes within a certain within certain sizes, uh, keep them as low as possible, of course. And it's nice because those kinds of tools um, let you see uh, if you make a change and you ship it to production, and then you suddenly see the the graph gets scarily high. Uh, you know you probably need to change it, and you get to see the history over time as well as we start making improvements. Um, but if you don't have Speed Curve, then you can also use Web Page Test, which is a great free resource. Um, that lets you do the same kind of thing, uh, just without the history uh, of it. So you have to just run the test yourself. Awesome, fantastic. The next one we had: uh, How do you perform? Uh, how do you prevent from performance regression scraping in the code with new features and pages added? Yeah, um, I think um, at SendCloud we you can do a few things. At SendCloud we have, as I said, speed curves. So uh, having that awareness, I think, is important. Making the culture of the development a little bit um about performance so making sure that people have their own dashboards uh, on speed curve in, in our case that are tracking things that they are keeping an eye on it that you have alerting when something changes um in terms of actually committing code uh for front-end development it's uh, often a key thing is did someone add an npm package and how big is that npm package because that's a usually a just something to keep an eye on or even sometimes if a, ver a major version change because sometimes the 
the size increases. Uh, there are also tools that let you put that into your CI pipeline so that you maybe you get a warning if it goes over a certain amount before you push the code to production. Uh, those are always good to look into. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that. And lastly, uh, last question is uh, from YouTube uh, itself, from Philip. Does Astro rely on a regular web navigation or on single page app style navigation? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm pretty sure it's regular web navigation. I think um, when you generate the site, um, it just it's very similar to the static site generates. It's that it will build out separate pages for you. I'm not sure if there's a way to put it into a single page application mode. Um, since I looked at it last, I don't remember seeing anything about routing between pages, but that may have changed. So um, it's being uh, updated constantly. So I believe it's regular web navigation, which is um, yeah, that's based on the browser. So we kind of know that's going to work. That's always a safe bet. Um, but I would encourage you to check the Astro docs. I think it's astro.build. They have a very nice site. Fantastic. We'll definitely uh, look into that. Uh, thanks, Rian. Your talk was great. Thank you for answering all the questions as well. Thank you very much. Uh, and yeah, always uh, happy to have you here. Uh, thanks, Hida, once again, for, for joining our talks. And thank you all for, for joining us today. The talk recording will be added onto the YouTube channel. Don't forget us to give us a, a subscribe there. Um, and also, you can find a write-up of, uh, of the talk on, uh, on our blog. That's dev.2 forward slash sendcloud. Uh, our next meetup is uh, planned for February 10th, uh, and you can RS RSVP on our meetup, and I hope to see you there. Thank you. <laughs>